I've been looking forward to having this conversation with James for such a long time. And if you want to be able to build a business that gives you the money that you want, doing the work that you love, having more freedom. And I think at the root of this, I dare say sovereignty as well, because I know this man has that as a true core value, then you're gonna to wanna to stick with us to the end. And I, that, I know that's a big, bold promise, and I'm gonna stand behind this because this beautiful human being right now is one of my best friends. And when we get together each and every week, quite literally, it's the most interesting, fascinating, valuable time of my entire week. We have a two something hour power hour of a coffee, food, sparkling water. And I just walk away with it with the biggest smile, but I also walk away with it a smarter human being doing so many more amazing things. And I just gotta say, James, I love you, dude. You're I love incredible. You too, bro. Thank You're you. really, really good. And specifically for today, because I know this is gonna be part one of many, uh, I wanna dive straight into this. And you said something profound before we hit the record button, which is there is infinite amount of niches that someone could be choosing for their business, but there are actually very limited amount of models that we could be working from. Explain that. Yeah, so I mean, the story of my life is a story of constraints mm. because, you know, 16 years ago, I started my first business and that was out knocking on doors, generating leads. And the constraint was, there's only so many doors to knock on, there's only, many, you know, there's only so many dogs to get bitten by, <laughs> there's only so many people in front of you. And I, and I was looking for the leverage of, that's beyond the thing in front of me. Mm. And um, that was generating leads online. So that was being self-taught, you know, WordPress and SEO and, and all the things that, that, w that, that were available to me back in the day, but working with that constraint. Mm. And then when that, when that business imploded and I went to work for someone and got a job in tech, it was like, Another constraint, I've got a job. I have to turn up nine to five, but I still want more. I still want more insight. I still want to be out there learning. And how do I get consulting clients on the side while I've still got a job? Mm. And for five years, I had a six-figure business on the side of a six-figure job mm. about constraints. And then as I had a family, Max, Eva, Michelle, the constraints of having a family, it's all, it's all been that theme of what is the right model mm. that fits my life? And I think there's a, there's a misunderstanding of what the internet has brought us. There's a misunderstanding that, you know, it's, it's the way to get clients, but really it's the way to put our unique ideas out into the world to an infinite number of problems. I mean, I was joking before that, you know, you could be a three-legged dog trainer. Like there's enough three-legged dogs in the world, but what model are you gonna, what model are you gonna choose to deliver that value yep. with the constraints that you have in your life? Because your business is there to feed your life, mm. not the other way around. Mm. Your life is not there to feed the business. So I've become obsessed over two decades of matching people with models and, and bringing that unique piece to the infinite number of possibilities that we have out in the world. You have a incredible quality, gift, skill to be able to see things that I literally, I'm like, no one else is seeing. Like you, you, you see things and you're able to articulate it and be able to act from that position of understanding it that I'm like, no one else knows what is that even going on right now. Uh, but before we go into this, into the models, I actually think I actually want to come back to the sovereignty piece first, yeah. because I feel like that is something that is kind of like a foundational level to work on. And us being, do you mean us living here in Bali, having families, we're a bit of a different breed than the rest going on right here. But when it comes to sovereignty, what does that mean for you? And how do you actually create that practically moving forward? I think um, sovereignty to me is that you build your own kingdom on earth. And the, the globalization, the internetification of everything, the, 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 the infinite connectivity we've had means that sovereignty means that you can exist in multiple places at once. And, and for me, sovereignty was always like, freedom is downstream of financial freedom. So if I got the underlying model that gave me financial freedom mm -hmm. above it, and, you know, over and above it, I could live my life how I wanted to live it. So those, sovereignty to me is balancing the model that you live your life with, mm -hmm. ma matching with the model that you're income. And in, you're like, whether we like it or not, we can, we can rail against the, you know, the ills of capitalism. 
we're in a world that where money matters. Mm. You know, money and money ad gives us freedom. Mm -hmm. um, I think people sometimes again get that the other way around that you know money is the route to freedom, mm -hmm. but it just gives us freedom and, and, and choice. So to me, sovereignty has always been about you know who am I, what are my highest values, and what's the operating system that I'm going to have mm. in my business and life that match that. And I think that's a dynamic, you know, moving target. You yeah. know, as as when as soon as you realize that you can do anything it's all, the optionality is a kind of overwhelming i can do anything i can be anything um and it's keeping the ego and things under control that you know w without stepping too far outside that how do you keep yourself in check because one of the ways i do it is by having you in my life because you that's <laughs> what i do too <laughs> that, like i think there's there is a brilliance that you have and bring to the table for everyone that I see that you work with, that is a a cutting through, a piercing of the veil to, yeah. you think you have this problem, but you actually have this problem and this is how it is best solved for it. I'm, I'm, I'm one of that? the best listeners in the world. Mm. And I, I needed to give that gift to myself because I've had to deal with so much anxiety and darkness mm -hmm. and within myself that I had to learn to listen to myself before I could listen to other people. You know, and having um, Michelle and I been together for over 20 years, you know, having children and those things were just levels to that listening. Mm -hmm. So to me, like, I'm one of the best listeners in the world because I had to, I had to save myself by listening to myself before I could help anybody else. So it's listening. It's I can hear the words coming out of Chris's mouth and you know after the past few months and the journey you've been on recently you know I had lots of words coming out of your mouth but then I was like what does that mean what does it mean to you why are you asking those questions why are you why are you making these statements mm -hmm. so I'm, I've just become a world-class listener in terms of what people are really trying to do and what they're what what are you really saying and what's the real intent of it how do you help someone cultivate that it's it takes a lot of time, you know, and in a hurried world, we do not sit down that often and just let things expand and, you know, meander through conversations. Um, the rituals that, you know, you and I have every week, I think they're really important because they're open-ended because you can spend time with people. Mm. And again like the internet has put constraints around things that everything's short everything has to happen in 15 seconds or 30 seconds or 60 seconds that only value can be transmitted in those pieces you know i don't do any coaching online anymore for the reason that i sit with people mm. and you know i had a client here recently and we sat for 12 hours talking you know just yeah we drank water and you know we ate food but we sat for 12 hours talking to, to tumble through, through those things so part of leverage to me in terms of the business and income and those things is just having the time to spend having those conversations because in this kind of harried world we're trying to restrict everything down to some kind of value piece yeah. and like consulting and coaching is always like i've got the answer mm. you've got the answer if i listen long enough mm. for what you're saying then we can get to a solution to the problem that you're actually trying to solve because you've already got the answer to it okay so when it comes to the models Let's look at the mistakes first and then start helping people avoid those mistakes and solve the problems that they have. When you're looking at a business owner, an entrepreneur, and we open the discussion up about, well, there are limited models. Let's talk about what those limited models might be and then how best to actually match the person with the business to the right model. Yeah. The, the, when you start, you just need to copy somebody. Mm. <laughs> you just need, you don't, you haven't earned the right to think yet. And if you, wanted, if you wanna build a leveraged online business, you just need to choose a problem, mm -hmm. make a promise that you can keep, and, and, serve, and build that in a container, which gives you enough time to solve that problem for a high enough profit. Mm -hmm. So you need to copy someone before you get to a million dollars. Mm -hmm. If you haven't made a million dollars online yet, you should copy relentlessly the problem that other people are solving and solve it in a unique way. Mm. Because that's 
the problem of copying. <laughs> you know, it's not bringing you a unique element. You're not bringing you unique skills, not bringing you a unique perspective. You know, and most of the people I've worked with over the years are, um, are practitioners in the sense they've, they've, they've built something that solves their own problems and then turn that into a product that helps solve other people's. Yes. So I think the first journey is what, who are you going to copy, who by all intents and purposes is li living and operating in a way that you align with yep. and can you copy that model? You know, models, don't, models, models are useful in terms of mapping what's going to happen and mapping the actions it takes. So you should ruthlessly copy mm before you make any decisions about what rules you're gonna break. Because you don't know yet, you've gotta get in the game, you've gotta generate profit, you've gotta fuck a lot of stuff up, you've gotta let a lot of people down, including yourself, you've gotta do things you hate, mm -hmm. before, until you really understand whether you hate them or not, or whether you're just resistant to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've gotta get in the game by mimicking something and copying it, um, but bringing your own unique perspective, because if you're too, if you copy too much and you copy too closely, you know, if you're too much of a funnel hacker, um, then what happens is that you have no leverage and no, um, no strategic advantage against the market and you don't bring your own unique, uh, unique skill to it. We've talked a lot about like the, um, this, the marks in the sand in which is like, okay, someone's starting off and is like zero into the most fantastic number, $10,000 a month. And then yep. it's like a, a 10,000 a month to 100,000 a month. And then it's like, 100,000 and then it kind of goes in like one threes and tens along the spectrum and things start to change along there. I've said before, and I know it's a crude way to think about it, and but I, I still stand behind in very much a case of like getting to say the 10,000, even I see more like 20,000 a month mark now, I said you don't have the right to think as in you just have yeah. to copy, you have to have this model, the way to do it, and you just need to do so that you start practicing in it. And if we kind of translated this to a, like an, a fitness analogy, it's like you just need to put good quality reps in and yeah. teach your body the movement pattern. 100%. And you're gonna learn the things that you don't like, and that doesn't matter because you're gonna have to do it anyway because you can't delegate it to no one because you have got no one to delegate it to, and there's processes through. I don't wanna have that conversation down that spectrum, I think what's fascinating to me is when the copying someone, role modeling someone breaks. Yep. Because. Which it does for everybody. Yes. <laughs> and so I did this, I held on to that for far too long. One yep. of the biggest mistakes I did was I was copying and using a model and mold, and I held on to that. Clenching onto it, oh, this can still work, and it clearly wasn't for so long. So when we get to a point that we now have to bend or break rules, how do you help people go through that? Because obviously you're you have a tr fantastic skill set of helping people that are kind of not so much the ones, but the three million a years up to ten million a years plus. Yeah. Like, where do you see those kind of molds and? principles start to change? Yeah, I, I, the first question, when people, when I work with people who are in the seven figure category, they're still doing a lot of stuff that got them there. Mm. So there's still, there's lots of people still in the DMs mm. who are, you know, hustled their way with their thumbs to get that first 10K or that first 100K and they're still there. Mm. So the first thing is, what are you unwilling to do now? You know, because um, if you're unwilling to do it, then you, because, People at seven figures have a huge tolerance for pain. Yeah. They will keep doing stuff even though it hurts. Yeah. But there's, there's some things that they're unwilling to still do and that are, that are keeping them back. So we find those things first. So th then once we've identified those is do those things still need to happen relative to where you are now and where you wanna go? Mm. Okay, well now we've got, we need to systemize the process of doing that. Who needs to be in the DMs or well, nowadays what? Is it a software or is it a human solution? Mm -hmm. So the all I do, and I'm giving away all my secrets, <laughs> is, is invert, not to the things they want, it's taking away the things they don't want so that they've got more energy to focus on the things that they want. So a lot of people I work with privately, you know, we, we zero in on the, this piece of IP and understand it's fractal. You know, I'll give you an example. I have a piece of IP called the Daily Client Machine. You know, and it's about selling a low ticket book that generates you know, cash flow um, and then generates high ticket clients off the back of it. 
So the daily client machine is multiple pieces of IP in a model. It's a, you've got a book in there where you can package it up. There's a course inside it. There's a group program inside it where you can work with people you know, in a group to collectively deliver it. And then there was an agency, you know, a, a very high ticket done for you kind of proposition. So once, you, once we've isolated, okay, you've got this piece of IP, you've got a central idea that you've helped people get results with that got you here, what options do we have that are gonna give you more leverage to take this piece of IP and multiply it across multiple? Do we need to write a book so we get more people in the front door mm -hmm. to do it? Do we need to build something much higher ticket and much more um, intensive or service-based that isn't currently in your skill set to deliver that to, to generate the profit? Can we generate more profits from your existing ideas with more people, mm -hmm. but allows you to stay in your lane, which is the mastery of a singular idea that solves a singular problem? Mm -hmm. So. If I, I'm, I've just become good at inverting things and taking things off people's plates that are no longer serving them so they have more energy to actually multiply the, their, their baby, which is their idea that has solved a problem so consistently over time. So it's not that I'm changing anything, it's I'm taking stuff away and then adding new ways to look at it so they can deliver and multiply. So there's a lot of addition through subtraction to begin with and then Focusing on the things that actually work. Yeah. What's proven to work. Yeah. Because, you know, th that our, our biggest challenge when we've got to a certain level of success yes. is, is our own delusion of, of ego. You know, and, and when, we, when, we, when we have a singular idea that solves a singular problem, it helps people make money, it helps people lose weight, understanding that the idea has more power than we do. Mm. That the idea that you've put out there is cultivated and, and taken by other people and innovated with really in the marketplace. And the more people we give our idea to, the better our idea becomes and innovate it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're a lover of philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the idea, the philosophical ideas that, that have stood the test of time have been tested and broken and, and, and the, the marketplace of humans mm -hmm. has actually tested those things over time, so they're proven. Yeah. So I, I just do the same thing with businesses in terms of what's the central idea here that's been beaten up and tested out in the marketplace that people have got results with and how do we multiply that with the right model that requires just the right amount of your energy to do it? Do you wanna work with less people at a much higher ticket? Do you wanna have much bigger impact? We need to you know, get, you know, work out where the graph is on the pricing elasticity to get that out into books, into courses, to licensing. You know, what I'm doing you know, increasing now is putting it in software, you know, putting ideas in software so people can push buttons and execute on the central promise of that idea, whether it's losing weight or making money. Where do you find people get most delusional about this process? That they are an important component of the process. <laughs> really, really <laughs> that, that, you know, I, I've helped people make a lot of money, yeah. right, through my ideas. I think it would be highly dangerous of me to say that I was the differentiating factor in them making the money. The idea that I shared with them and helped them cultivate and develop is the thing that made them a lot of money. Mm -hmm they still do the work, they are out there. And you know, we've seen, especially in the online coaching and consulting spaces where the guru has become a thing, a lot of people attaching them, themselves to the result that their clients get. And that's a, that's a very difficult trap. To, it's a very dangerous trap to fall into because if you believe that you are the only route to them getting the thing they want, then you delude themselves and you eventually run into the ceiling where you have to put, oh well, if they don't get on a call with me, they're not gonna get the result. If they're not available to talk to me, they're yes. not gonna get the result. Yes. The reality is the central idea, um, you know, once it's cultivated and developed enough, you should be able to put that in anybody's hands. Hola, I want to say a big thank you, muchas gracias for listening to the show. Now, really quickly, this show is growing and it's all thanks to the ratings and reviews. So really quickly, I want to ask if you have not left a review for the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever else that you listen, take the 30 seconds, please click on over, leave a review as I really want to hear from you and I want to know what is the best thing so I can cover in future episodes. What guests to bring in? What questions can I answer for you? What is it that you're getting out of being a part of this show as well? And I just want to say thank you so much for being a part of this show success. Thank you so much for clicking over, leaving a review. Now let's get back to the episode. And if they've got enough will and desire, they can go and take that and get, get the result that they desire. I remember talking with um, Alex Hormozzi in 2018, the first time we met him, and he goes, you can get winners to win, 
but you will only truly win when you can get losers to win. Yeah. And I think that planted a seed where I was like, oh, I start to understand now where the actually getting someone to win, and again, the crude words like turning a loser into a winner, but it is what it is. Yeah. And having a system and a process in place that does that. And it took a lot of bashing of my ego to finally let go to be like, oh, this is so beyond me. And then figuring out, well, what is it that I love to do? What is it that I'm good at doing? And was it you that shared the, was it Dan Kennedy? Where it was like, if you just work on your weaknesses, you'll just have really strong weaknesses. And I was just like, oh, that's so true. And understanding how do we best position what we do and how our business does what it needs to do to be able to get this result. And then I want you to talk to as well, the flywheel effect, because you talking to me about that has been profound in my thinking process for everything, especially with what I'm doing with my life now and moving forward. So when you're helping someone with a model, James, to have that, how do you help them instill or install a flywheel so that things become easier? The, I spent, a very intensive amount of time in um, in the daily deal market. So when my business blew up um, a dozen years ago, I went and got a job. And the the daily deal market was very interesting because essentially a, a marketplace is a is an arbitrator of, of supply and demand. So what you've got to kind of work out is what comes first. Mm. You know, so in a marketplace, we needed local businesses to discount their product and put it on our platform so then customers would come and be attracted to that deal and become our customer and the business's customer. So if you thought, think of that as a triangle, then it's a static triangle. If you think of that as a flywheel, which is the more businesses we bring on the, and the better the business, the, con, the better the consumers that we bring on, mm. the more valuable they are to the business and subsequently us, which allows us to bring on better businesses, mm. then that starts to rotate around. Mm. And when you take this principle to into um, the, the knowledge economy or coaching and services, what you understand is that you're actually defined by a very, very small group of customers and that you're much more defined about the people that you don't work with than the people that you do. Mm. So building a flywheel is a, is a process of customer selection that happens in the specificity that you need to communicate with the market that I'm world class at solving this problem for these people who are feeling this way, who are in this current situation, who have done these things before. And the, when the flywheel starts, it means that you can essentially build the business off a tiny, tiny, tiny handful of people who get outstanding results because those people bring in other people. Mm. Humans are very mimetic in the sense that, you know, if we all shouted fire, everyone's gonna to run towards it. Mm. So it's about, it's about getting really, really clear on you know, the problem, the promise, you know, and the profile of those people. So you're, you're actually solving a, a, a problem for a, down to one person and that multiplication effect for the marketplace. Because everyone goes wrong when they're trying to solve multiple problems for multiple people. You know? So it's getting to the, um, the specificity of like, who is this for, who's on the other side of that? Really, really getting clear about that boring old thing called an avatar. Mm -hmm. And getting, and getting specific about that to let the flywheel start because you start firing the crappy clients, you start firing the cancer, getting rid of the cancer, you start getting rid of team and people who don't fit with that vision that this is the person that we're here to serve and this is the, this is the flywheel effect that we're gonna build around those people to, to, to continue and, and, and make sure you got the right model to feed that. I know especially like one of the groups that we're in, it's very much a case of I'm paying not to be in this room, I'm paying for the people that are not in this room. Yeah. And I think that's, that may be difficult for a lot of people in the starting stages to truly grasp because I know in so many cases when I've started things, it was a case of like, if you have a credit card and a pulse, like yeah. I'll take you on, like let's yeah. do this. But obviously that has to change, especially when we're talking the spectrums down the path of growing a substantial business. Why do you think Ultimately, I am actually fascinated for you to answer this. Why do you think people aren't growing the business the way that they want to? 
and by that I mean like getting to the revenue goals or feeling the way they want to feel about their business? Um, <laughs> there are lots of reasons. I think the world, the world as we are now is very uncertain, right? So people are seeking certainty. So when people can't see someone out there who's living the life that they want to live in the way that they want to live and they don't have a model mm. and they, they don't have a, a, a template to go on, it's very hard to feel that the things that you want and you secretly desire are actually possible. Mm. So I don't want to put it down to a product of belief, mm. but I think it's that, that you just haven't found the model that is worth you replicating and tearing apart and actually participating in mm. that will actually get to the things you want because it's out there. Mm. And I, th I think people just, they latch on to the short term promises of like more money or lose weight fast or wherever those promises are because that, that might provide a little bit of ease tomorrow. But ultimately I don't think people get where they want to go because they're not clear about where they want to go, who they want to go there, what they're not prepared to compromise on the way mm. and a model that they can actually unpick in, in doing that. You know, I, the diversity of my friends, the diversity of my business relationships, the diversity of my partners, the diversity of my clients are all blessings to me because they give me different models. Mm. I learn things from different industries and bring them across and cross pollinate them. You know, I just copy stuff from over there because I see it working there and then we take it over there. Mm. So I think ultimately they, people don't get the results they want because they don't believe that that they can get there in the way that they want to without compromising their values and their desires and they haven't sought enough of the model yet and the model doesn't need to be like hire a coach and pay him five grand it could just be a way of living it could just be a, a stance towards the world it could be like it's it, it's a fundamental feeling that i can i can apply the things that i believe to that template and actually get the thing that i want yes how do you apply that to yourself like what's your what's your internal dialogue now as you're going through what you're going through the, that I know nothing. <laughs> that, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I will be a lifelong learner until the moment I die that my, like my highest value is insight. Mm. So I, I constantly want my ideas to be challenged to show me the things that I don't know so I can see things that, that how, the things that I do know and apply them to my ideas and other people's ideas to make them better. Mm. You know, so having the highest, the highest value of insight means that I'm constantly talking or exploring and, and, and applying ideas and cross-pollinating them and, and, and putting them out into the wild as fast as possible. You know, and that's led nowadays to amazing partnerships with people because I'm like, I don't have the time or the bandwidth to put all, out there all these ideas myself, so I'm letting them go. I'm, I'm setting them free. I'm getting so much insight and, and I'm, I'm on an insight flywheel yeah. because I'm getting into rooms now because I don't sell coaching and I don't sell this that I'm partnering and advising people mm -hmm. that I wasn't able to before because I, I was a competitor mm -hmm. to these people mm -hmm. selling coaching and these things. But nowadays I can, get, I can collect so much insight that I don't have enough avenues to put that insight out to the world and, and have an impact, you know, whether it's profit or whether it's you know, number of customers or whether it's just putting ideas out there and helping people do something. So for me it's... it's it's where, where can I get insight yep. and then where can I give it back through multiple channels that aren't just mine, that I'm not in a scarcity mindset of like, this is my idea. Yes. You know, this is, this yeah. is I don't have the bandwidth yeah. to I put all the like ideas that. out that I've got. Mm -hmm. So I should just give them to other people. And then if I get involved in the upside of that, great. If I don't, I'll give them to people who can do something with them. So there's a lot of focus with collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot because what we were talking about earlier this morning as well was about how we can't have the answer or most likely we don't have the answer for absolutely everything. Yeah. And that's okay. And it's kind of like the, the death of the guru Yeah. where the guru before has the, all the ultimate answers right now, but like it's at a point where it's like, well, it's okay for you not to, but then how does it still become a solution, the best solution in the marketplace. Yeah, I, the, the number one mindset for me was my dealing with, I guess people call it money mindset. Yeah. Dealing with a scarcity based mindset, which, yeah. which forced me to hold on to things tightly and make them, that I had to own everything. That my only route to being accepted by the world mm. was making more money and you know, all, the, all the things that we've, 
we have to deal with in our in our lives the am I good enough piece mm. and and I realized that kind of money and all these things were like sand like as, if you put them in your hand and you squeezed as tight as possible to try and guard them that that was the faster way they leaked out and as soon as I started to open up towards you know it sounds so trite but towards abundance that that doesn't that doesn't measure me the doing rather than talking it's like Marcus Aurelius is quote about having a war like waste no more time arguing about what a good man should be be one yeah and for me I have that on the wall because it just comes to like just do and stop talking like there's so much wasted time and effort in shit words coming out of someone's mouth at the end of the day yeah. and just focus on being my best self doing the best work that I can possibly do I was thinking about like us having this conversation today and one thing that came up for me that I thought was really interesting in the way that you operate uh, is an example of like Euclidean and non-Euclidean like math and so like non-Euclidean math talks to the point of an example is people say uh, like parallel lines parallel lines in non-Euclidean math meet Mm. now by definition parallel lines will never meet Mm. because they're parallel lines well not in non-Euclidean math and for an example where are two parallel lines meet what's an example of two parallel lines meeting North Pole and the South Pole. You have your longitudes and your latitudes, yeah. but you'll see that the parallel lines actually will come to meet. Yeah. Why? Because in nature, we don't have straight lines. They are not squares. Things are mostly round. And that's why I see with you, where people are operating thinking things are just like straight lined. You have this brilliant skill and gift to see things as they are, which is in nature, and where you can see a concept and say, oh no, parallel lines can meet, and here's a perfect example of how that works. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a profound point in, in the side that, which I, I rail on this point a lot, around your business identity. Mm. You know, and, and in the online space, everyone wants to easily categorize someone else. Mm. They're a coach, mm. they're a consultant, they have an agency, right? I'm a world-class coach who doesn't sell coaching. Mm. I'm a world-class consultant who doesn't really sell consulting. Mm. You know, I, I, I do, but I, I prefer to partner with people to, to build longer-term relationships. I can deliver agency services because I've got a team who can do stuff, right? So I think it's that transcendence from this is my business identity that you just stumbled into anyway. We all just stumbled into this thing. Yeah. That they are just skills that wearing the different hats of those skills makes you multidisciplinary, makes you a true polymath and able to operate and be anti-fragile in lots of different places, but in business and in life. So I, I, I just don't buy into the, the, simplis, the simplistic categorizations that people have when they say, I'm a coach. People are saying that because it's profitable to categorize yourself there for a period of time. But if you don't accumulate the other skills that are related to that in terms of consulting, mentorship, leadership, and all those kind of pieces, and you don't, aren't able to wear those hats, then you're gonna be one dimensional both to yourself, but also to the marketplace, because they're, they're gonna want to categorize you. And the more, the more definitive you are about, I am only this thing, yeah. the more they, they, they will pick the edges about, well, you can't be my CFO then, you can't help me with finance, you can't help yeah. me with those things. Yeah. So I've always had taken the polymath approach, you know, sometimes to the detriment of like focus because mm-hmm. I've accumulated so many skills. Mm-hmm. But I think in terms of non-parallel lines is like, you know, non-categorization is that if you, if you, the more you try and categorize yourself and, and, the, and define yourself as a coach, the more unhappy you'll be as well to the market because you're multidimensional. You're also, a husband or a wife and a father or a mother and a you know and you, you, it, it, the more people try and define themselves to the marketplace and and you know um uh, be the dancing bear to a certain piece and say i'm only this mm. the more they um the more they risk that eventual blow up when they want the world to see them for their true depth yeah it's like the phrase like when you name me you negate me and uh or the famous, I remember you saying this a little while ago, like how everyone says in their like Instagram bios, I help X, Y, Z. Do you know what I mean? Like, and it's just like that the phrase of like, I get it. And I think as well, where someone might hear this and say, oh, but I'm supposed to choose a niche. I'm supposed to do all these things 
there's also there's there is a paradox that has to be held yeah. which is well yes but there's also another side of it like it's not just black and white there is nuance yeah. that has to happen in this and i know for sure like i held i held the label of personal trainer mm way too long mm. like i was i stopped personal training and done like moved on to the online business and, done this, and i was still like literally using like like when someone asked like what do you do i would yeah. say that and it was interesting as well i think i said this last time we were together just before i exited the company i had some videos come back and then like the lower third it said like ceo and i'm like well i'm not a ceo like yeah. that's there was a label that i had attached upon myself and I could peel that label off. And for me, it was a case of like, well, what do I replace it with if I want to replace it with? Like, what do I put there in that space, in that void, in that vacuum that's there right yeah. now? And that's interesting because I'm still going through that and kind of like wanting to loosely hold what those labels are. Yeah, I think the, 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 the online world and you know, 160 character bios and things has accelerated that, that that desire for a simple label that everybody understands you and categorizes you. I, I, I have people ask me all the time, what do you do? And I'm like, I'm just James. <laughs> you know, and, and I think, you know, I saw, that, I saw that when we exited a business, you know, a very large business that was sold and we all lost our job titles. You know, I stopped being the CMO and I felt that pain of like, you know, the, the, the three letters being wrapped off in terms of the identity. Yeah. So I think the, the, the 160 character bios have kind of made people try and pigeonhole themselves into a certain thing and then try and break out of that and the tension and then blow up mm -hmm. and saying, I'm all, I'm, I'm all these amazing things and, and define their identity as a single thing that I help X get Y and almost everybody just holds onto the season too long. You know, the, the, and, and, it, and I think there's an, an acknowledgement that it's just a season of your life that you, you build a business over four and a half years and that was a season yeah. and it's honored and it's kind of buried now but the skills and the things that you got through there the relationships mm. they're the things that matter mm. and then you'll move on to the next thing and that will be loosely defined and then it might be tightly defined mm. and then it will be loosely defined again mm. so i think we we've oversimplified the world into 160 character bios you know and 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 say that well you're only valuable to me because you help personal trainers make 10 grand a month yeah. or you're only valuable to me because you help business coaches get to 20k you're only valuable to me because you help people lose 10 kilos in 90 days yeah. the reality is that person behind it has a lot more value than that they've just chosen to they've chosen to pigeonhole themselves for a bit to attract enough attention so they can monetize that idea all right one more question because i know we could just go for days selfishly i want to go for days <laughs> uh, I feel like we just have like a camel back with just like water so we can keep going. But we need Rogan levels of um, <laughs> recording, recording time. When, okay, we were talking about this previously, which was the case of someone's model matching what it is they actually do for their clients. Yeah. And similarities, differences, what that looks like on a circle jerk kind of way that can happen in there, but also what is actually most eff effective and efficient for both the business owner, the marketplace and the consumer. How do you best help someone navigate through those waters? I wanna know what they've done before. <laughs> you know, the, the, if, you, if you go back far enough in someone's personal history, they've solved a painful problem for themselves mm -hmm. that was so painful they would go through immense amounts of pain to actually solve it. Mm -hmm. And once you find that singular problem, and once you find that singular solution, that, that singular desire and the solution, never, you have this infinite possibility. You know, we have a, um, a very good mutual friend who is an artist, mm. right? And he's a coach mm. and he works with business coaches, but he's a complete artist. And he basically, his motivation to build a business was so he could get paid to make more art, right? Yeah. And yeah. it just happens that he's built an eight figure business out of the back of that. Yeah. So it's like, what's the primary motivation of someone? What are they here to do? What's the thing, what's the desire that will never go away? And once you've got that, you can build out from the model. Yeah. So I build models around a human mm. because the human is the power the human, the human energy needs to recruit other human energy to be coaches, to be salespeople, to be marketers, to be customers, everything. 
So I, I just find the, the, the essence of the person and then build a model around that mm. and understand how can they uniquely orientate to the world. You know, for the artist that's showing up, how many people can we get to see the art? Yeah. You know, and for the, you know, for the operator, it's probably drilling down. You know, how many people can we get to see the, the mechanics of actually building the machine and, and, the, and the ones and zeros? So I don't believe there's a cookie cutter, you know, answer to, to actually break through the barriers that people naturally have in their marketplaces. I just have a collection of models that I then build around a person to orientate themselves naturally towards the marketplace so they can continue to operate with the minimum amount of, um, of stress and energy. I think that's one of the most insightful pieces that you just said, there is no cookie cutter answer. And I think that's where empowerment comes from, from here being like, oh, okay, I am not going to search for a cookie cutter answer, but I'm gonna open up to the ability to mold and flow and kind of like work with what's needed as well. Oh, you're amazing. You're an amazing human being. I love you very Thanks, much, sir. James. Uh, where does everyone go to find out more about Mr. James Kemp right now? Oh, just find me on Facebook. I'll probably accept your friend request. Um, and then you can message me and say, what do you actually do? <laughs> I hope everyone sends him a message to so what the answer is going to be. I'll put the links in the show notes. James, Thank you, I really love you. I really admire you. I really respect you. You're incredible. I strongly invite and urge you to make sure that you get more of James Kemp in your life because that has been one of my selfish desires for myself as well. So thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much for joining me in this episode. I really, truly hope that you have enjoyed this. Now, if you haven't subscribed to the show, please do so because it would be a bummer if you'd miss out on the amazing episodes that are going to be coming. And one of the best ways for you to be able to support the show is to leave a review and to be able to share it out on social. And if you do share it out on social, please tag me. My handle is at Chris Dufay, that's Chris, D-U-F-E-Y, as I would love to say a personal thank you for you being sharing it out and for you to join us on the show as well. And as always, thank you so much. I feel privileged, I feel thankful, I feel grateful. Uh, I feel really blessed being able to do this and being able to have you join us as we figure this stuff out that we call life at the end of the day and being able to do it with amazing conversations that we do here in this show together as well. So I'm wishing you an amazing day and I'm really looking forward to us coming together in the next episode.